Christ Community Church and C3 Media presents the Deeper Dive Podcast. Pastor Dina and Pastor Mitch are about to take you on a deeper dive into the Bible. So here is your host, Pastor Dina Harder. Well, hey there, and welcome back to our season two uh, Deeper Dive Podcast. And of course, Pastor Dina here with the one and only... Uh, Pastor Mitch, and we'll say Happy New Year. Oh, yeah. Happy New Year to you. Yeah. How about that? It's a new podcast season. New it is. year. It is. New adventures. Always. There's always adventures with us. And um, I'm just really pumped about this new series that we are launching into today. It's going to be called Frequently Asked Questions or FAQs. So I tried to see if there was some kind of updated statement for that, but that's what I still see out there, FAQs. And so we are going to address some of the most frequently asked questions about Christianity or when you're trying to share your faith with others. Um, But as we launch into it, I thought it would be great to start with just the actual conversation itself, because there's some things about that that we hope will help you because our encouragement to you is we want you to be able to have conversations with others around you. That's No, that's really good. The uh, frequently asked questions, as you say, the FAQs, there's so many things that are that create um, for us, like you, you get all... Um, confused you get uh, nervous there's like I don't know the answer but you'll find out the devil's not creative that's right the devil's not an original and Mm -hmm. once you learn the answers to certain common questions they Mm -hmm. and they never change yeah so it's kind of interesting talking to campus ministers who 40 years apart from when I was campus ministry to where they're at the questions really don't change. In mm-hmm. fact, in some ways, they get more simple. We'll get yeah. it, we'll get into that. Yeah. But it's like some of the questions even get more basic, such as, "Am I male or female?" <laughs> I mean, you think about some of these questions that people are going through today. Yeah. That you know, a decade ago or a generation ago would never have been asked. Mm-hmm. But a lot of the same ones are there as far as Absolutely. you know. If God is so good, why is there evil in the world? Or yeah. Is why is Jesus the only way? You know, aren't there other things I can do? What about other religions? And so there's a lot of questions, and our hope is that this will help equip you as we dive into these questions um, that you'll feel a little bit more comfortable stepping out and sharing with others. So, speaking, because you kind of alluded to it, um, what started this journey or this thought for the series that we're launching is um, Pastor Mitch often shares you know, some of the testimonies of when he started out in ministry. And what we're doing now is what you started out doing all the time, answering people's questions because you were out on a lot of campuses, if I'm correct with that. So why don't you just give us a little bit of your history? A little bit of a history. A little bit. When you get as old as <laughs> I am, I have a lot, I, when you get as old as I am, I have a lot of history. There's yeah. a long history here. It's not short. <laughs> we'll set a timer on but this. <laughs> here's the, here's the, the the short and skinny of the whole thing. I um, had an encounter with Jesus when I was in high school. And so when I graduated from high school, went to college, I really was training for ministry all throughout this. So when I graduated from college, I uh, was married, and we um, really were part of a very dynamic campus ministry and had an opportunity to go start a campus church in Bloomington, Indiana. And in the middle of starting the campus church and just being a chance to minister and talk to people, I had a chance to travel to a lot of different places uh, for you know a couple of years as uh, setting up, helping start to strengthen and also to start campus churches. So that's where my experiences came from. So I have traveled all over the United States, so all the major, basically your major campuses, what they call your Power Five conference schools, is where I went. Why don't you share what those are? 
Well, <laughs> for people get, like me that don't know what the Power Five, the Power conference. Five, that's that's all your like Division One <laughs> athletics. That would be like your Big Ten conference, your yeah. ACC conference, SEC conference, Big Twelve, but then, and also the Pac Twelve. So you went. I know you went out to California. Yeah, I was in California Berkeley. multiple times. <laughs> out at Berkeley, they call it Berserkly because it's crazy. It's like Oakland is right next to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And if you are familiar with anything about some of the radical uh, teachings that came onto our campus scene, it, a lot of it started in California, and Berkeley was like the epicenter of all this radicalism that came yeah. out the protest against the Vietnam War, Jane Fonda doing all this stuff. All, a lot of stuff just happened in Berkeley. So uh, to me, when you bring that campus up and some of the experiences you had there, it um, relates a lot to what we are seeing today <laughs> because you described just some things, you know, the drug culture and just all the different ones and knowing that those are things that are permeating every campus today. But you, you were able to speak with a lot of different individuals from a lot of different backgrounds when you were at these campuses. Yeah, that's, that's what the joy, I think, of campus ministry is. You meet mm -hmm. all types of people, all different backgrounds, all different cultures, a lot of times different world religions, mm -hmm. and you have a chance to see, okay, how is Jesus going to reach that person? Yeah. And you did this for how many years? Well, for several years. Before yeah, you travel, came? Yeah, before I came to Penn State. When you started yeah. as a campus minister yeah, I was here? Yeah, I was in ministry for about three to four years before I came here. Okay. So with that, um, that's why I just felt like, you know, we can tap into some of those testimonies because when you share them, even now, because recently at a staff meeting, you were sharing something from those years with some of our campus staff, and it just dawned on me at that point, these experiences will help all of us. It doesn't matter, you know, if it was 10 years ago, if it was 30 years ago, that we, fail, we face a lot of the same things when somebody says, oh, you know, why aren't you sharing your faith? Yeah. You know, there's fear. There's what if I don't have answers to the questions? There's a lot of things that pop up, and those are things that we all face regardless of whether it's now or 30 years ago. Well, my friend Rice Brooks wrote a book years ago called Change the Campus, Change the World. Yeah. And what they found out is what happens on the campus will hit the streets at about 10 years later. So usually you can say that whatever is the trend on campus today will show up on the streets a few years down the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can get into the whole thing like the LBGTQ and all this stuff, but a lot of this started on campuses. Yeah. So as we begin to jump into just the conversation um, you know, you were speaking, I believe, last Sunday or the Sunday before about follow me. Mm -hmm. And so depending when you listen to this podcast, it may be a different Sunday, but you can always go to CCC website and uh, go back to what would have been the date, uh, January 17th. Would that be correct is when you spoke or 16th, 16. 2022. I would encourage you to listen to that message, follow me. And you made a statement that said, you know, if we're following Jesus, we should be fishing. What does that mean? Well, if you look at your Bible and look at the words of Jesus, when he called his disciples, he said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so then he gave in the Great Commission that we would all go unto all the world, preach the gospel. And so we're all called to be followers of him and to be, quote, fishing for men. And so we want to help equip you in that. So let's start with the motivation. Why do we share our faith with others? You know, that's a great start. If you take the familiar Bible verse that everybody knows, if you ever watch any pro football games, there's always a guy in the end zone that holds up a little <laughs> sign. And what does it say? It's yellow, and he has a scripture reference. It says, John... 316. John I think 316. I know this one. <laughs> okay, well, go ahead. Showcase your <laughs> pastoral I'm not even looking it up yet, but get your Bibles ready. John 316, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever, that means whoever it is that believes in him, will not perish, but will have everlasting life. 
for God so loved. loved the world. Now, verses 17 and 18 says he didn't send his son into the world to condemn, condemn the, the world, world, but that the world might be saved, saved through him. So the point is, the whole motivation is that Jesus loves people. Yeah. Yeah. So we want to share our faith with other people because he loves them, even if it may be somebody that we don't know or that maybe we don't think we love <laughs> somebody that we've, we've had a difficult time with. And so this is your first deeper dive. Um, open your Bibles or your apps, whatever you look at, to Luke 10. So Luke 10, that's one of the Gospels. And we are going to look at the story of the Good Samaritan. That Jesus gets into a conversation because this really ties into... Uh, the first part, this motivation of why we want to share our faith and with whom. So we have Luke 10, and I'm going to go ahead and just start in verse 25 and read through the end 37. And this time I'm reading out of the New King James, but you follow along with whatever version you're using. And so behold, a certain man stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? That's a big question. Um, mm -hmm. Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? For uh, what is your reading of it? And so he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have rightly answered do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself to Jesus, said, who is my neighbor? And that's a key question that we have, which ties into this motivation of who do we share with and why. So then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at that place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him, bandaged his wounds, poured on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So Jesus said to him, Which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. There's so much in that, but I'm going to let you unpack the main points in this. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting that the, the main question was, what do I do to inherit or to receive or gain eternal life? And yeah. that should be a question everybody should at least have a plan on how you plan yeah. on getting to have, have an answer to that to <laughs> eternal life. Yeah. And for most people, they you'll have to say, you know, Pastor Dina, most people would say, I'm going to heaven because I'm basically a good person. Yeah. I didn't murder anybody, mm -hmm. at least nothing I can think of. <laughs> I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't uh, like, you know, I, I haven't done these worst stealing things sins, and, you know, yeah. and doing all this stuff. And yet, when you really think about comparing your life, the standard is never another human being right. in terms of another man or woman. The standard is always and will always continue to be Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the real issue is what do you do with the gift that God gives? Yes. Do you accept it or do you reject it? Mm -hmm. So with Jesus is speaking to this man that are under the Old Testament law, mm -hmm. which is based on works, which is based on uh, the works, which is what he said, is to love God with all your heart, soul, mm -hmm. mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. If you do these things, you'll live. 
Yeah. So this guy realizing that he gave Jesus not only the right answer, mm -hmm. but like most of us, you can know the right answer. That doesn't mean you're going to do it. Yeah. Well, and there's some key things in who is my neighbor. Jesus giving this parable about some of the guys that came through and who finally ended up helping the, the man who was beat up. Yeah, the heroes of the culture, the priests, the Levite, these are the these are the authority figures. These are mm -hmm. like your po politicians of the day. They carry the dual status as mm -hmm. religious leaders and political leaders. And Jesus is saying, you know, basically the government's not helping you, the church is not helping you, but I'm going to go down if you would. I'll put it in my words. I'm going to go down to the ghetto. I'm going to find this really poor person there and I'm going to let them uh, be the one that's going to be the hero in this story, the despised, marginalized, Samaritan, half-breed mm -hmm. Jewish people. Mm -hmm. This is the hero of the story. Yeah, because the Samaritans and the Jews were not friends. Oh, they're antagonistic, yeah. I saw this uh, on a, a TikTok video, if you ever watched TikTok, but there was this lady who was homeless, and this guy walked up to her and said, hey, can can I take you to breakfast? She said, no, I'm already eaten, but I'll go with you and I'll sit with you. So they went over to the local, you know, fast food place, sat down, and she was telling her story to him as he's having breakfast. And at the end of the breakfast, this guy gave this homeless lady $500 because she was willing to take time to go sit with him, even though she wasn't hungry. Mm -hmm. and listen to his story and talk to him. And it was so, it was like he already had a plan to give the money. Mm -hmm. But the fact it was a homeless lady that went to spend time with this guy. Hmm. And you just never know how the Lord's going to bring an answer to you. Mm -hmm. But Jesus is speaking to the prejudice that was there in their culture. Yes. And saying, this is the hero of the story, the good Samaritan. Because they're mm -hmm. always like, what good could come out of Samaria? What yeah. is use is that? That whole race of people are worthless. Mm -hmm. And I think it's another thing. We, we talked about this yesterday about uh, helping resettle some refugees from Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. But they said that Afghanistan is not really a nation. It's a tribal group of people and every tribe is competing with each other for superiority mm. and, do and do domination. So we don't get it living in America, but in the rest of the world, your tribe is very, very important. Mm -hmm. So when you say you're a Samaritan, I'm assuring you, you have no standing. Mm -hmm. It's like saying you're from Kentucky. You just, oh, there you, you go. Have, you that just have, You don't have any standing. <laughs> you're just like, it's like, there's no, I'll say credibility or things like that. And I believe the Lord is is trying to address our, if you would, our built-in biases and prejudice mm -hmm. that we have to say, here's the hero of the story. It's the good Samaritan. Yeah. Yeah. And to the man he was speaking to, a Pharisee of Pharisees is what most say, um, that was despicable. How yeah. dare you think that I would respond to a Samaritan? And so we share this because there is obviously a lot in that story, but just knowing who are we to share our faith with? That would be everyone we come in contact with. That That's not only, I mean, absolutely true, but I, I just want to go to another aspect of this. When they talk about eternal life, immediately it's like, okay, love God. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, anybody can say, I love God. But as we're told in 1 John, if you don't help your brother who you see in need, mm -hmm. then how does the love of God exist in you? Yeah. James says, how can you tell your brother, be warm, be filled, and not give them the practical things they need? Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is your eternal life, think about this, your eternal life depends on how you treat or interact with another person. Yeah. That gives it a little bit more weight. Yeah. And to realize, too, if we have experienced the goodness of God and the relationship with God through Christ Jesus then why would we not be sharing that with others? We want them to receive that good news. Yeah. And so that is our motivation to share is out of love. And I know for myself, we've talked about this a lot. If you're sharing with people that maybe either one you don't know or maybe stand on opposite sides of you with whatever issue it might be, there's a lot of issues out there right now, um, to realize, okay, you can simply pray. And we always say, 
if you know you're going to go have a conversation versus something that just kind of happens, maybe you sit beside buddy, somebody on a bus and you just start talking. But if you know you're going to go into a conversation, pray over that first and pray that God will give you the words to speak. But I also pray that he would give me his heart for that person, That's because good. when we see really them good. through his eyes, it's through eyes of love. That's really good. I was, I was thinking about that in this in this um, story that Jesus told, this narrative. There's not a uh, the person comes to Jesus and ask him a question. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about all the times. Sometimes people ask me questions. They find out I'm a minister. I'm in ministry, but for the most part, I've been the one that's had to start the conversation. I'm, mm -hmm. I rarely have people come up and ask me things. I was thinking one time I'd gotten through speaking, and this girl came up to me and she goes you just have this fascinating aura around you. I see, I didn't realize she, how new age she was, but she was like, I was had all this blue aura around me and it was really sparking lights in her that I was a good guy because <laughs> I had this aura. And, uh, but, but rarely do I get those kind of comments. It's, mm -hmm. it's not the aura part, but just people coming up to ask you questions. Yeah. Most of the time it's, it's you initiating, mm -hmm. speaking to that person. Yeah. And I think one of the things I've seen is uh, just recently for, for staff, we were out for a staff luncheon and we weren't saying who we were or anything else to the waitress. But as uh, the waitress came back to give us something, you made a comment about her tattoo and just started asking, oh, you know, what is that or what does it mean to you? So realizing there's ways to even initiate conversations. And I just thought it was so good because it wasn't, forcing your way into okay and now i'm a minister and i want to tell you about jesus but it kind of led into talking about her faith and just her journey and where she was at in life that was the most amazing conversation because mm -hmm. someone said this to me i'll blame don i think don said it to me <laughs> must be but i was told that if a person has a tattoo there's a story to it mm -hmm. and they want that's why they're wearing it they want you to ask them their story so I always try to do it in a non-aggressive form, but just mm -hmm. as if they're willing and they have a moment. I'm not trying, like a waitress at a restaurant, they're busy. They don't, you know, they're mm -hmm. going to sit there and chat with you for 20 minutes. But it's like if you get the opportunity, I just ask questions, especially mm -hmm. if they are wearing a very visible tattoo. Mm -hmm. Then what does that mean to you? Is that What is the significance of that to you? And get them to tell you the story. So with her, it opened up, which I'm trying to get to, is that tattoo opened up her to talk about that she had a grandfather mm -hmm. that was in the ministry mm -hmm. and it was obvious through the through the conversation what was said and what wasn't said mm -hmm. that she was running from God. Yeah. She was on a fast mm -hmm. track to get away from grandpa in that <laughs> church and to find her own destiny in her own life with mm -hmm. how she was living. Yeah. And to know that we felt like after it just kind of um sunk into your spirit that maybe we were an answer to the grandfather's prayers of just sowing a seed of saying, well, hey, we've got a campus ministry here because she was a college student. Um, and, you know, if you want to get connected, you can look them up. And so it was just a way to put a little seed of faith out there and reconnect with that faith that was in her life. But I just say it again to help you overcome your fear in reaching out to somebody what if you are an answer to someone's prayer in that person's life? Maybe a mom, a dad, a sibling. It could be a child that's praying for their parents. You never know. And so by you stepping out, you could answer somebody's prayer. Yeah, you know, saying that, there was uh, just, just to try to encourage people, you never know the conditions that people are going through. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just got a report about a young man, 16 mm. years old, that just committed suicide. Yeah. And uh, I just keep thinking about what were his friends that they had reached out to him or someone who was a mm -hmm. Christ father, someone who loved Jesus, had taken the time to share with him the hope that, uh, you know, the things may be really discouraging. You may be looking at some really negative situations in your life but that's not the end of the story mm -hmm. don't make it the final chapter there's more that god has to write in your story and to me that's the hope that we have that's the joy that's yeah. the excitement that we have that's so good so good so i just want to touch on one more thing to wrap up this podcast and that's talking more about how to share 
and looking at because uh, I this kind of comes out of my experience and I know as you've uh, as we've talked about it there's a lot of others that have been in that time frame of just how do you not get um, defensive or get uptight and start getting there's another word but just you know, as you're trying to talk with somebody. <laughs> and I remember you saying then, and even again, as we were talking this morning, that we're not called to be an attorney for God. Like he doesn't need us to defend him. And so realizing we want to have these conversations, but actually in a conversational way and be able to talk with somebody, not get on the defensive so if we just look, your other deeper dive point for today, 2 Timothy chapter 2. So Timothy is further along. You're in Luke. You just keep going to the right, and you'll find 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we're just going to simply look at verses 23 through 25. So I will just read these as you are finding that. It says, but... Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate, generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach. This other word, patient, that's a good one. In humility, correcting those who are in op- opposition, if God perhaps will be grant them repentance so they may know the truth. So you want to be gentle. You want to be patient with them. Do you want to speak to that one? <laughs> oh, that's one of my main stumbling blocks. Oh. No, one of my main stumbling blocks, patience. <laughs> and that um, as we're gentle, as we are patient, and as we listen, it doesn't say that there, but we can just tell you one of the main qualities of sharing with people is being a good listener. Because a lot of times you want to hear what they're not saying, like we said, and and watching them, you know, body language says a lot. But I just want to take a moment if you have comments just about as you're sharing. Uh, you just brought up some just excellent scriptures. I would encourage anyone just if you take a moment, just read through the two books of Timothy. They're very short. Mm-hmm. The chapters are very short, but they have just incredible amount of information that helps us. Like he, he tells Timothy over and over again, avoids foolish speculations and yeah. questions that generate strife and mm-hmm. quit talking about things that don't add to faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so we're not telling people go out and try to have doctrinal disputes with other Christians or, you know, with people that are going to church. That's not what we don't want us to try to argue people into a different, uh, I don't know. Absolutely. It talks about the gospel. It's the simplicity that's in Christ. There you go. It's not a, uh, God didn't call you to be a rocket scientist. And if you are one, God bless you. I know several and they're brilliant men. They love God and they got (laughs) incredible minds. But the point is, is that when you, when you're talking to people about Jesus, it's, it's a very simple, straightforward Mm -hmm. approach about he Mm -hmm. loves you. He died for you. Mm-hmm. Do you accept or reject his gift? Yeah. And I've had people tell me over and over again, well, I didn't ask Christ to die for me. No, you didn't. But he chose to die as your substitution. Mm-hmm. He took your place for your shortcomings and your sin and your failures. Yeah. And that's the joy we have is to mm-hmm. let people, because a lot of people have never even heard that. Mm-hmm. The girl that you met to from Pittsburgh that had never heard about Jesus. Tell that story. Yeah, yeah. Well, and we'll have more testimonies to share. But yes, don't ever assume because a girl that was from Pittsburgh, not from another country, uh, came here to to campus. And as I was talking with her, she had never even heard of Jesus. I expected that from people from other countries, but I didn't expect that from people within the United States. And she was American. It's not like she, you know, came here from another country and decided to live here. She was born, you know, Caucasian American, but she had never heard of Jesus. And so she was a clean slate. And actually, those people are ones that are easier to witness to and share with than people who may have 
had an experience and a bad experience and then walked away from church or faith, um, they're the ones that may have more arguments. But we just want to encourage you. It's through the love of God. You don't have to have all the answers because that is a common thing that people say, well, what if I don't know the answer to a question? Um, well, if you go at that, I mean, you're, you're never going to have all the answers to every single thing, but you have the answer, and that's Jesus. So you let him operate through you out of love, through patience. And there's another scripture that we refer to a lot in Romans that is the kindness of God that leads us to salvation. How did we get saved? It's because we encountered Jesus. We encountered his love, his kindness, and that's where we knew this is what I want. It's through that. And that's the same thing that's going to bring others to a relationship with him. No, that's really good. I think there's so many times in this scripture, you go back to it, it talks about that the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. And I think there's a lot of times that I know when I first started out, I was all about the truth and getting the truth. And when mm -hmm. I learned kingdom truths, I was so excited that people who disagreed with me, not only were they wrong, but I was going to prove to them they were yes. wrong. <laughs> and that's not the, that's not really the general attitude because the Bible says we want to encourage people in their faith. Yeah. You know, I don't have to encourage in your doubt. You have natural doubts. Your <laughs> doubt, your doubt feeds on its own, grows on its own. You can just be all by yourself, and guess what? You can be full of doubt. And it, it just it just comes natural. <laughs> that is true. But when I talk about faith, now I'm talking about, you know, and it's kind of funny. People put their faith in so many different things. Like one of the most interesting things I read uh, a while back was that there are more people that believe in Elvis still being alive today <laughs> than tithe to the local church. He's you not. Have, wait. He's not alive? I can assure you. <laughs> My man Elvis <laughs> ain't nothing but a hound dog. Oh, du, du, here we go. Du, 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 du. <laughs> we'll bring everybody. You back everybody to saying that at the to end. stop. I thought it was You're doing there great. right now. <laughs> but the point is, my man Elvis, he's not here. Elvis has left the building. Elvis is gone. <laughs> Elvis is not coming back. Mm -hmm. I went and watched a film about him one time. I had my best friend. He, he and his mom. She, she was a big Elvis, <laughs> you know, just devotee. So we went to the movie theater and watched this thing on Elvis. Bless his heart towards the end of his life, my man. Just not quite he, the he, same. He, he had a rough patch. I was <laughs> like, he had a rough patch. He was so anyhow the sequin suits and everything. He's just but you know at one time he was like he was the oh he yeah was it. they called him the king. My right? mom my mom loved Elvis. My mom <laughs> loved Elvis. But anyway, more people believe that Elvis is alive than tithe to the local church, mm -hmm. and they got it on percentages. Six percent of the American population believes Elvis is still alive. Only 4% of the people in evangelical churches tithe. And I think that study was uh, done a few years ago, so it's probably even less. I hope I not. hate to but say. The, <laughs> but my point is, is that what you believe, mm -hmm. what you believe influences your behavior. Yeah. So when you come back to eternal life, like the lawyer asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Mm-hmm. There was a belief that's there that there is a life after death. Mm -hmm. If there is a life after death, what do I need to do to experience that? And I think everybody has to answer that question because we're all going to die. Unless Jesus comes back in your mm -hmm. lifetime, yep. you're going to go through that transition. And the question is, what are you going to do with that? Yeah. And so that's where Jesus said, you're going to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, body, strength, and Love your neighbors yourself. <laughs> and that is where we, I think, as a church, fall inadequately short. Because honestly, we're so busy with our own issues, our own struggles, that we don't have enough energy, time, maybe. Not not you can have you can have care and compassion, but you're so caught up in your own stuff. Yeah. You don't have the energy to try to help somebody else. Mm -hmm. So our hope is to encourage you to step outside yourself and we're trying to make it a little bit easier because some, we build up so many excuses as to why we can't do that. And so through this, uh, beginning with this episode, we're hope 
we hope that you feel a little bit more equipped, not as overwhelmed or fearful, that you can reach out to those around you and begin these conversations. I just, coming back to the, the original opening comment you made, which is if you're following Jesus, he said, I, Jesus, I, Jesus, will make you, Mitch, mm -hmm. a fisher of men. There you go. And so it's, again, a faith walk. I have to trust that God will take me with my limited skill set mm -hmm. and help me become a productive follower of him. Yeah. And when you think about it, it's not based on education. Mm -hmm. It's not based on looks. I won't make any more comments about that. <laughs> it's not based on your charisma and your personality. Mm -hmm. All those things are nice factors to have, but the end of the at the end of the day, it still has to be a faith that mm -hmm. Christ can use you. Yes. That Jesus will make you where you will be a fisher of men. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite scriptures in, in Acts is where the Pharisees were looking at Peter and John after they were testifying about Jesus, and they couldn't figure it out. And they said, these are, you know, uneducated, ordinary men, but they had been with Jesus. That was the only thing that they could see because they knew them uh, when they were fearful disciples <laughs> and now they saw this boldness come out of them and they knew the only difference was they had been with Jesus so as we spend time with Jesus we spend time in his word um, you will feel that equipping we will have his presence within us to be able to share with others no there's so much to that I just want to just just kind of buttress up again what you just said is that you're in God's presence, you're with Jesus, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden there's just this, God just gives you this love for people that you normally wouldn't give the time of day to. Yeah. People that you wouldn't have no no concerns for. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's supernatural. That's, yeah. that's God manifesting himself mm -hmm. through you. And it's so exciting when you see somebody receive Jesus, make that decision. Once you are a part of that conversation and that happens and you can see that occur in someone's life, <laughs> you will never stop sharing your faith because it's the best thing whenever you see somebody receive Christ and make that decision for themselves. The other thing that you have and we all have as followers of Christ is our own testimony. And so that is why throughout this um however long we are on this frequently asked questions every couple of weeks i'm going to take time to share a testimony with you to have somebody come in and share the testimony of how jesus changed their life because uh, we've just been hearing some amazing testimonies and as you hear that it's so exciting to see the joy of a transformed life. So we'll be sharing that with you. And to end on a testimony, because you were sharing this with me before the podcast, um, just to give you uh, an example of how to share, have a conversation. You were talking about, did you say you were on a campus in Wisconsin or where was it? Minnesota. Ah, close. Well, <laughs> I, was at, I was at the University of Minnesota when I was traveling. and We had a two-week outreach going on. And when we say two-week outreach, that meant that at the University of Minnesota at Minneapolis, we were at the main campus and we did outreach meetings. So, so at night, you would work on the campus during the day, invite people to the outreach meeting that night. And I happened to be the speaker for a two-week period, and it was glorious. Those are fun. Those are fun, <laughs> fun moments in my memory. But uh, one of the things we would do is we would do a, what you call like a sweep before the service started, we would just go to different dorms at the time, and of course this is pre-COVID, but we would be able to go to the dorms and just invite people to come out to the meeting. And so they had a room where one of the guys had come and he had said, why don't you guys stop by? So we stopped by his room and he had several roommates. I think there was four of them in their room together. He was a, ran track for the University of Minnesota and his roommate was a swimmer. And Dennis was there on the top bunk, and we were just talking about, you know, spiritual things. And Dennis let it be known he was not interested. Is that the swimmer? That's the swimmer. Okay. Yeah, my track friend, Mark, he was all about it, but Dennis was not about it. It's like, I, you know, and Dennis gave, gave some, you know, cocky answers, and it was just, it was obvious he was not 
feeling the vibe of <laughs> wanting to go to a religious meeting. Much like a lot of church people that, I, I, that I've seen at Christ Community. I don't know what it is. They don't, don't you think they don't, they, don't, they don't get the, they don't want the vibe of coming to church. Not true. But anyway, but anyway so, so Dennis said, it, you know, I'm not interested. And you know, when, you, when, you're, when you're walking in love towards people, you can say things that may seem to be um, hard, but if they're said in love, people will accept it. And I just remember as we we're getting ready to walk out of the room, this was maybe a five minute conversation at best between multiple people. So it wasn't like one person dominating the whole room. I just looked at Dennis and I said, I hope the cross in your heart is as big as the cross that you're wearing around your neck and walked out. And so needless to say, Dennis came the next night, not that night because he had to go swim practice, but the next night he came gave his life to Christ, went into Christian ministry, wrote me a letter, this is back a few years ago, describing his travels all over the world as he's discipling young men, he's written books, he does crusades, he does seminars, he travels with another mutual friend named Rusty Russell, they are moving out, doing all this incredible stuff, and he's always thanking me, saying, Mitch, thank you for taking the time to stop by my dorm room. Thank you for taking the moment to ask me that question because when you asked about having the cross in my heart, like the one around my neck, it pierced me. It's like I realized I was not serving Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's so powerful because there would have been a lot of opportunities for you to just fire off a smart aleck right. answer to him. Right. <laughs> but you were listening to the Holy Spirit. He gave you that question to ask. And because of it, which just, you know, again, is another point that not only he ended up deciding to follow Jesus wholeheartedly, gave his life to Christ, but now his family. So it's it's generational influence by one question that yeah. you ask yeah. and just in that conversation. So you never know. So I just hope, and I asked Pastor Mitch to share that as we are closing out today, to say, you never know what God's going to do through you, through your life. And so we hope this is just kind of, as we would say, wet your whistle, get you interested in what some of the frequently asked questions are, how to answer those questions, and, you know, begin that journey of stepping out in your faith to fish for men. Also, as we have these, um, please feel free to give a comment. Um, let us know if there's questions that you face that you would like us to tackle in this podcast, uh, because we're going to just continue this on for a while. So thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward. Yep. Happy New Year. It's going to be a great year. 22 yeah. will be your best year yet. Amen to that. So until next time, God bless. Thank you for joining us. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. And if you liked what you heard today, please consider donating. You can support C3 by clicking the giving button on our homepage at cccsc.org or by texting cccsc to 833-257-5698. Thanks again and have an awesome day. And remember, God has a great plan for your life.